Oh, we are in Easton. And um, the weather is gorgeous and the temperature is great. And I, to be honest, I, lo I love Easton because Easton is, uh, I have, you know, Easton has a special place in my heart. Not because of Plain Air Easton, <laughs> no. Uh, I was coming here even before Plain Air Easton because I just love the, you know, town and the atmosphere and everything else, even though it's kind of a liberal, but I'm not on the liberal side. Uh, we're talking about art, we're not talking about politics. All right, anyway, I just got text from um, Stuart and we're going to on location where he selected what to paint and we're going to set it up. All right, so let's go. Here we go. So, I'm down at the uh, Yeah, we are in uh, Easton and we have a privilege of um, meeting with one of the legends of plein air movement in the United States, Stuart White. Hi, I'm Stuart White and I'm out here today in Easton, Maryland to show you a big basic plein air painting. Why do I do plein air painting? The reason I like doing plein air painting is that I've learned something almost every time I paint. It's something about observation of natural light and shape and form is what informs your whole knowledge of painting. I see these as basically a means to an end. And that's to learn about nature, nature and to learn about space and to learn about myself. And what do I mean by that? That I learn about my prejudices and I learn about what I like and don't like. And I have a whole conversation between all this magnificent, which is a, a scene I'm about to paint, and this painting here. So I'll get started right away. Uh, the first thing about uh, painting is to get your, get your space organized. I have this, this part here. I kind of see where I want to go. I want to make a few little marks of where I want to be so I don't end up uh, changing proportions on things. And I like to paint as sort of a contour way of just following the edges around. And I mean, keep in mind that the drawing is part of the finished painting in watercolor, because I'm not going to be able to paint over these lines. But I just need enough to get grounded and know where my paint's going to go and uh, try not to erase a lot of stuff from your drawing because your eraser will disturb the surface of the paper and you're going to want that and it'll show um, all those little eraser marks. This building is a Dutch style building that I've, I've always admired. Uh, it's got this wonderful heroic window. Uh, there's a wonderful design in there. All that stuff is really going to become unimportant because the big thing is this shape. But I want to do enough. There's a light coming through this window and that I want to make sure I don't paint over that. And it's a small thing, but it'll feature uh, much more important and significant in the painting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember in drawing architecture in general, window, windows aren't randomly placed. There they stack on each other. Or they, they uh, there's a certain order to them. So find out what that order is when you're doing that. Okay, so this comes down. You find out the relationships of the storefront to the rest of the building. And if, you, if I squint my eyes, which is a good thing to do when you're painting, is to see that a lot of the details disappear, that this is basically a dark mass set off by a, a display of light behind it. 
And in the forefront, there's, there's streaking light, but not very much. And we're going to eliminate a lot of these extraneous details. It's very hard to uh, do good paintings if you don't have a lot of good drawing in there. Think about, think about the thickness and, of your line just by putting a little bit of pressure on it and make things a little bit darker to emphasize uh, some of the things that you are think important. And you don't think it's too important, just kind of lighten up on it. Okay, one of the things about about this is perspective. Now this is pretty flat, so I don't have a anything more than a one point perspective, which just means from where I'm standing everything goes into one point. Which right along these really my eye level is uh, probably right around here about these heads that I drew, that that's kind of where my horizon is. So there is actually a hill that goes down here. So that vanishing point is going to be lower than that. So I want those lines to kind of disappear to some point below where my eye is. So that means this corner of that has to kind of come down like that. So I've, I'm having to move my head around to uh, get around these obstacles here because I really want to take those things out. Now there's a whole lot of little detail down in here. I just don't get caught up in that. Just, uh, just put a few squiggles and there we go. All right, I think I basically have everything uh, in place. Let me get this, this line here and this line over here. And then we're going to... From where I'm standing, it's a straight line down to my feet. And there's a couple of cars. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on getting all this drawing right. Like I say, it's just to, to give me some kind of direction of where to go with the painting and with the washes. Uh, okay. All right. So that's basically it. What I want to do is like have a spray of this gold autumn leaves uh, coming here. I want to pick it up again down in here. I want to this building is going to cast a shadow down in here, which will be cool. And this will be a warm uh, highlight right in here. And the, the basically, that's basically it. I don't want to, I don't want to overcomplicate it. There's a lot going on. Uh, there's trash cans, there's meters, there's other cars in here. Um, all of that stuff is just going to be a distraction. I want your eye to go back into that point there. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, I'm going to be uh, starting with the big washes. I think about this as a stage set, and the background is is a pale blue. I just don't want to think, oh, that's blue, and start mixing a blue. I want to give it uh, some other kind of colors that 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 indicate lightness and uh, indicate uh, 
some neutrals. Still show and take a t you know, blue right out of your tube and start adding blue. Just uh, I think adding a little yellow ochre to a blue sky, just a little bit tones it down. And and if it's not the right color blue that I want, I can keep augmenting it. But um, that's what I'm going to do. Just going to add a little more. And just go make these smooth, even marks. This is going to be darker than the sky, so you just go ahead and paint right over it. But this will be lighter, so you want to uh, kind of hold off. And if the, if it, the paint seems like it's dark enough, then you need to go darker because it's going to dry about three times lighter than what you have. So, but now it's, you know, the paint's running down. Uh, and this kind of stuff is, is the, the stuff you really want to keep because it's really beautiful. It, it paints itself. And you couldn't imitate that, that look of those paint, that paint running down with the water. And it gets brighter and warmer uh, as it goes down to the ground. So let's just do that. How do you do that without adding yellows to the blue? You're going to get a green, but that that horizon line is not green. So the trick is to keep it very, very pale and just warmer without going, you know, adding yellow oranges or things like that. So I add this uh, uh, color called uh, Jaune Brillant or Naples Yellow is, is, is good as well, but it, it warms it up without turning green. Okay, and so down here, while this is still wet, just keep bringing that, that paint down. And I don't really think too much about what colors are right now because we, the beauty of this is the transparency that you can keep, keep adding colors to it and, and change its character. Now these kind of marks here, this is not a very particularly rough paper, but when you have these things, it's nice to keep them as long as you can because you add a certain freshness and sparkle that you may find handy. You may find that it's not uh, useful at all, but you have the option to keep it or paint over it. Now back in the far distance, that's just an abstraction and uh, there's not a whole lot you need to do with that. Uh, this is a very simple brush. It's not a uh, particularly expensive. But it gives me a lot of different marks, and I can get a lot of the painting done with just this. Or you can use a larger brush, like the rounds uh, or the mops. But this one uh, just seems to do most most of the heavy labor. And it looks pretty cool. It's it's I've had it for a long time, and it's pretty beat up, but it it still gives really nice marks. All right, well, this is like a piece of, uh, you know, laundry on a line. This is drying at the top and it's coming down here. This is going to stay wet for some time. So things I want to watch out for is a buildup of paint that might push back into the uh, into a drier parts of the painting. And you get these little little uh, rough edges. I don't happen to dislike that one. But down here, you want to keep sopping up uh, things and just keeping uh, the paint from flooding back into the painting. All right, here, uh, I think we can get a pretty decent edge up here. Looks like it. Yep. Yeah. And uh, 
I can tell with my eye, which is, you know, the human eye is, you know, it's really starting to get wet right around here, but the human eye can distinguish all kinds of tones within a shadow. You have to sort of you know, blot that out and just concentrate on the big idea. Yeah, this is going to be mostly uh, mostly light, and I, I want to introduce that while it's still wet, is to get that uh, get that in there, and so that it keeps really fresh and colorful right in here. But uh, at this point, this is the area I'm going to work in because I know pretty much how wet it is or how dry it is. Yeah. If you need to get back to um, some paper, just squeeze out a brush and sort of mop out what you don't want, and then come on in and uh, flush it out. I think we've got some sort of uh, these colors of autumn tend to, the tendency is to exaggerate them. And I think that starting with brighter colors is a good idea, but you could need to eventually tone them down a bit so they're not so uh, they don't sort of shout out at you. These are uh, some green golds. Some are very muted colors. Uh, whoop. At this point, uh, I would say just lay some colors in there because we're going to go in and, and try, you know, try some different textures, and we'll be uh, playing with the colors. I can't decide right now if those are the colors that I want, but I'll get around to that point. So there's no need to panic. Uh, just get some stuff down. Okay, now this is still still wet, and it's uh, way too light. So I want to uh, introduce more, some warmer colors, and there we go. Um, So at this point is where the brick stops. Um, okay. So at this point, it's starting to take shape as far as the light and the dark and you know, where we have the uh, the big shapes. And 
Uh, and now I'm starting to sort of look at the painting and look at the scene, look at the painting and say, well, where does this want to go? And uh, how can I make this, you know, create the depth that I see? Mm -hmm. and, Okay. Um, there's a red-ish tree down in there that I really like. I don't want to lose it, but I don't want to paint it on top of the shadow. I want it to be a part of the shadow. So it uh, now is the time to put adding those things. And what I'm doing is pulling out, spreading out the the brush so that I get different marks that would simulate um, those tree shapes. And while that's wet, I want to feed that with some other colors and let that just explode into that, that wet area. Okay. Okay. Now this is got a beautiful thing. Whatever I put down in here, it's going to run right into it. I know there's a hard line in the uh, in the building, and this is a storefront facade. But I don't want to emphasize that there's a separation. So I'm going to bring these two together a bit, just by uh, taking that that cool violet color and bringing it down. Okay. Um, okay, I think at this point, uh, I need to sort of uh, see what I've got here. I think there's lots of bits and pieces. I can get that towards the end. I want to get these these storefronts uh, while this is still sort of wet so that the edges kind of blend back into them and they don't lay on the surface and come forward. So... Um, where we've got like a, a bit of a transom, then we've got some merchandise in the, in the window. So just leave a couple of air holes and maybe a figure. And I know it's bleeding a lot around there, but I keep thinking to myself, it's going to be okay. I'm not going to worry. It's just a shape and I don't have to have these hard edges. 
which is a hard thing for me to do because as an architectural illustrator, they wanted to see every, the, the A meaning the, the client, wanted to see every shape of the window, every door, every, every little detail. But in plein air painting, that's not important. Right. I'm not sure what I'm going to do in here, but if I don't know what I'm going to do, don't paint it. Just hold off on it until you do know. Okay, at this point, I'm going to uh, just put a tone on this sidewalk. And... Okay. And I want to mirror that over here. Don't have to do a lot of it, just enough to like make a connection between one side of the street to the other. And there's a little brick knee wall over here. So you pull those tones together. And it, it's not clear to me what's going on over there. It's some kind of park. Um, but anyway, I want to let this sort of cook and do what it's going to do. And I want to let the shape suggest what, what I could paint on it later. Um, OK, let's change brushes at this point. And all right, so let's say with the smaller brush, let's go ahead and, and start making things a little sharper up here. And um, I can see that there's a little form here. Um, I'm not going to be too concerned with detail because uh, basically it won't matter unless you're the owner of one of these buildings, you really won't be counting the windows. So after that, I, th I think what I want to do is uh, just get, you know make these forms come together and uh, and keep simplifying. The main idea was to get light on the building and this you know wonderful shape, and it's not any more complicated than that. If you know. Now this is almost too dry because things are going to come forward, but it's just enough that I can get some nice edges and uh, start to just suggest that there's some ornamentation up here in this window. And just by putting cool tones on there, it, uh, it makes it believable that and it's a different material and all that. It's just, all we are looking for right now is just character. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see, oh yeah, here we go. Okay. 
Um, these windows have a reflection on them, and so you just need some sort of kind of warmish gray. Uh, I, I don't often uh, spell out what the colors are that I'm using. It's, I think it's a little distracting to get into color recipes. I, th I think it's important to uh, think about the value of it and the, the, the temperature of it. And if you can figure those things out, um, the color itself becomes less important. And I used to hate it when a, a teacher would just say, I, it's not important what the color recipe is because I really want to know. And I appreciate and know that it, um, that is. But I can only say that there's no substitute for spending time with your palette and lots of paper and just try out a whole lot of different things so that you know how to go get the color you want and, and how to mix them. So we have a lot of people here. The way of doing lots of people is that to do, think about, think about this group of people like down the street, they're walking over here, not as a set of individuals, but think of them as one organism with, with many different, uh, different uh, you know, legs and arms and hats and heads going off in all directions, but you have to connect them all together. Uh, that way you don't get caught up in, uh, in like the anatomy of it or how they're doing. You just put them down there. And then once they're down there, then you can start to animate the organism into what becomes, in your mind, it becomes a, a group of people. So now they're moving down the street. So now I have to kind of remember what they look like. And there's people over here. And when I say, like, what I'm learning by being outside and painting is that, uh, you know, I, I get a sense of how the space has suddenly become much more active than it was when I started. And, and I begin to... Uh, I don't know, I, get, I guess I get, <laughs> it sounds corny, but I find myself being in the moment and it just that this is a happening. I'm out on the street being filmed and I'm, I'm painting and uh, it's just sort of part of the whole scene. When you do people, don't do a, a rhythm like I just was getting started to do. Here's one, two, three, four. Just break it up into... Uh, into a diff different sequences so you don't create this monotony of, of, a, of a rhythm. You can add some you know, bright tones in there. Um, just lay the color on and let it kind of bleed in. It makes for a much more interesting visual experience rather than actually trying to paint, this is a shoe, this is a shirt, this is a hat. Um, you can do that in small places, but you really don't need to do it uh, for a group of people. And I'll just, like, the window up there mm -hmm. needs a little, uh, I'm just going to use a little opaque paint, and I'm just going to suggest a few things. Now, the thing with watercolor, I think with most paints, it's, it's that way. But watercolor in particular, there are uh, things that it does that are unique to its own nature. The medium itself is probably 80% of the delight of a good painting, is to see how the medium uh, behaves, what it does when you layer it, when it does when it's, when it's opaque and somewhat transparent, how it beads up. Some of those things can be quite delightful. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't say I look at that and say that's a group of people, but I could you know, start to pull out bits of them, can start to like work it. But I want to keep some of this lovely bleeding that's going on with a thicker 
a viscosity of paint on top of a thinner one. And I'm looking for opportunities now, like where can I uh, exploit that? Okay, there's a, there's, uh, I can put a, a mass of foliage right over here that would somewhat frame this group of people and uh, turn accidents into something that you can use. Like uh, here, let's put a cool blue on top of the shape that is now, you wouldn't recognize that as a stack of dishes, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there's some sort of celebratory banner up here. Again, it doesn't matter what it is, just it's, it's something that, it adds to all the jewelry that's going on here at the street level and it gets calmer as it goes up. Now this is all washed out now, which I'm not too crazy about. So I'd like to uh, warm that up a bit. And nothing, nothing quite warms like uh, a little, little rose color. And I'm just gonna put a few strokes right here. And then with clear water, just come down and bring it up. Leave little highlights around the windows and tie these in together. And then I'm going to have to do something with those lines. Not sure what, but uh, it's basically bad drawing. But now while this is all wet, I could say, well, let's, let's add a little, a little yellow down in here, and that'll warm it up. What I'm constantly finding out is that you can't compete with nature. Maybe you just do the best you can. And, and hope you come away from this whole experience with a, a painting and, and a, a memory of the place and the time. Okay, I notice we've got some cars over there. There's a lot of formulas for doing cars. Best formula is just look at them and paint what you see, paint the shape and um, if it's a windscreen, uh, you know, windshield or something like that, and if you can't distinguish it between the rest of the car, just paint it out because it's in shade or something like that. Um, I am always trying to figure out a way to do cars without making them look like a... Like a like a formula for doing cars. Okay. Okay, wrapping up right now, just seeing a few things that, that I don't think I would be able to remember when I get back to the studio. Keep in mind, this is not a, a final work of art sometimes they can turn out to be quite nice but don't get too caught up in that uh, how is this going to end up and is this is a good painting or a bad painting this is this is basically a happening you're in space and you are learning something now this is kind of a fun area to to get your, your mark making down, you hold your brush in the back and try to create the, the character of all these little leaves without painting all those little leaves.
Uh, the thing I like about the fall is, of course, I think everybody likes about the fall is like the, the color of, of leaves. If you're in a part of the world where you have hardwoods like we do here in Easton, and it's every one of those leaves become almost electric, like they got plugged in with the light is shining through it. I can't get that in paint. That's, that's just nature, and that's more or less uh, sculpture. But, uh, you know, you can sort of suggest it a little bit. And when you take it away from here, uh, you can, uh, I don't know, try to, try to get as close as you can to those, those beautiful leaves. But you know, maybe a little opaque paint in there. Uh, I've got this bright orange. I see the bright orange, but it's mostly a, a dull tone. But if you leave some of the underpainting shining through, then you start to get that, that illusion and uh, the sense of magic of what all those leaves are doing, we hope. Uh, I think maybe a little blue in here would, would go a long way. All right. Now this is a funny brush that I use. It's got a point and it's got a big heavy body to it. It makes pretty unpredictable marks. But uh, uh, so I'm just going to kind of scribble a kind of calligraphy in there and uh, hope I don't screw things up too badly. Okay. Okay. Later on, I'll be adding different things in here. There might be some. Uh, some, uh, some dry brush. Um. Okay, wonderful. People coming down the road. Um. And in, in these areas, you can start to have fun with uh, abstract shapes and uh, things like that. But you do that at your own point. You don't need to really be out here. Uh, I think to wrap up. Okay, so I guess in the spirit of plein air, you come out and you've, you've done your painting. You don't have to stay here forever. It's a moment in light. And what we wanted to do was get, well, it's a crisp, beautiful day in fall. And uh, I can't come close to like actually repeating everything here. I, I want to get a painting that your eye uh, bounces around from corner to corner and has a good time. I think watercolor is really good for that. And that's something to just keep in mind. Now, things to watch out for are getting muddy, getting things overworked, uh, for having weak washes and all that sort of thing. And those are just things to keep in mind. And you study and study and you'll figure out when you've got it and when you have it. Uh, now I'll let this, I'll let this settle for a bit and like a, a, like a good stew or a soup, you let it settle and then start to add things to it, little spicy things and uh, as, as needed. But for now, this is, this is what, uh, I've got enough here to go on. And, uh, and that's essentially it. It's basically a sketch of a moment in time. How you start painting? Um, in your, how you started your career? Oh, how I start my career? Yes. Uh, as a plein air painter? Yeah, as a plein air painter. As, as an artist. As an artist. Yes. 
Well, I think I always uh, knew that if whatever I did, I'd always be painting and drawing. It's something I love to do. So it, it wouldn't have to be, you have to be that or have to be this. It was something, you can always be an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, to to uh, do that and nothing else, that's a conscious decision. So you can find several things to do that. And one is we'll always be drawing, always be sketching. And there's an opportunity for that, basically. What I did is through architecture and conceptual uh, visioning, okay. things like that. And that right. started maybe 30 years ago. So what is your experience in painting from, from start? What did you start painting and until today? How many years? How many years? I would say, uh, well, I'm 70 now. And I've probably been painting since I got into the army. I was in, went to art school prior to that. So, oh, right. so in high school, I was, uh, I got an idea that I was above average in that field. So it's 50? Field. Yeah. About 50, wow. 50 years. So. 50 years of experience of painting. It sounds like a job, but no, I was always painting. <laughs> but the job part happened maybe th uh, 40 years ago. 40 years ago. No, and when yeah. you start to uh, plein air? Because I, I, have to, I have to say to everybody that you are the legend of plein air uh, events in, here in the United States, because everybody's looking at you as the, uh, from, from kind of from beginning, you started from plein air. I mean, plein air of the United States without you probably it doesn't sound well <laughs> you yeah, are always I, the, uh, the you know the face of plein air uh, from for many artists who are starting and no. even for you know like myself yeah uh, well that's interesting to hear that from my perspective but i'd have to say that yeah that the, the plein air easton event which wasn't far i lived in baltimore it wasn't far for me to get here um, and winning a big prize and then winning lots of other little prizes it was uh, was like a thing that, you know, it's validation. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, keep doing this. This is great. Uh, so I'd have to to uh, <laughs> to say that that that's that's what what started. And I think that the more I was out here doing it, the more I would learn about what other artists are doing. And I was uh, certainly certainly thrown into a community that it's, it has its own uh, you know, celebrities and okay. legends, if you, if you, if you use your word. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that was the kind of the, the, the process, process of doing a... Do you think this is the, the same process that happened um, a long time ago in France and Paris? Was impressionistic, like a movement? Was that the same? Thing? Oh, it's... it's uh, well, there it did feel like a movement. This, if only, feels like a sort of activity that you would do as a painter, as as a movement of like we're going outdoors. We're not painting history paintings. We're not doing Napoleon's battles and right. etc. We're actually just bringing in the daylight from the outdoors into your home, has its its own its own raison d'etre. You know. Okay. So Claude Manet probably thought that it was activity too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, just speak. <laughs> I think, but I, I know prior to the, say the French Impressionism, Impressionists, said painters from Northern Europe were going down to Naples and, and Italy to paint scenes. And they painted oil on paper. They took these sketches back with them, and then they would make uh, you know scenes of of uh, the crucifixion and they would do all these different yeah. things. So it was it was an activity in the sense that this is for study, this is for understanding light and for understanding form, to understand uh, color harmonies, etc. Everything, yeah. So what is in your career? What is what will be the next next step? Uh, the next step is <laughs> To me, I'm well, excited about the next step because I'm uh, restless inside, and I think doing like plein air all the time as sort of this is the end all is is uh, it's not quite uh, doing it for me. There's other things I want to explore about the visual world, uh, about the unconscious, for example, and about uh, uh, you know how we we relate to form emotionally, things like that, I, just things to ponder. But, uh, you know, the, the, the act of what we're doing is painting and drawing is as far back as we can, it's of any record 
yeah. of who we are as people and human beings. And I find myself connected to that linkage that goes all the way back to the caves in Lascaux. Wow. Know. Okay. Don't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. 100%. I have to be. <laughs> I have to be like, just like you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you mentioned when we were talking uh, before, you said that you started from in Europe, right? You were in the family of uh, your father was civil engineer yeah. uh, and he was doing a lot of projects in Europe. So you have some influence of, you know, seeing those in museums, uh, visiting the museums. Yes. Uh, no. Yes. Unquestionably, yeah. it was, uh, you know, my mother uh, took my, me and my uh, brothers and sisters to, uh, sister, to museums, and whether we wanted to go or not, we, we would uh, uh, go see all these great buildings, that, you know, besides the zoo and all the other yeah, great yeah. stuff in, in these wonderful cities. But in Europe, uh, because of the great collections that are out there, uh, I eventually really began to look forward to these trips to the museums and to see, you know, the Van Goghs and the, uh, the Manes and then David and all the sorts of genre. I wasn't really stuck to anyone. It's all uh, just a mystery to me how these things were accomplished, you know, how they were done, you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I can see in your, even your approach of painting, it's, there is definitely influence of uh, European kind of style of impressionist. Impressionism and yeah, I'd have those. to say yeah, uh, oh, definitely proud of that because uh, uh, there's schools of painting that I'm still discovering. I went to this in Palermo recently. They have a museum there, and I saw some Italian paintings from the 19th century that I was like, I've never seen these before. They're oh. magnificent, and I think Europe's probably just loaded with that kind of stuff. If, uh, yeah. yeah, they come out and the Spanish uh, painters, uh, fascinated with them and their ability to capture light and uh, uh, who was it, the, I'm drawing a blank on certain names, but there was a, if you go to the Musée d'Orsay, you see these uh, scenes of skirmishes, say, for yeah. example, and you're like, how are they able to do that? I mean, it's just, uh, probably watched less TV than I did. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and spend more time drawing and yeah, painting. There was no iPhone at that time. <laughs> That's probably why. So the oil, uh, is it your secondary medium or? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Second, I would say so. So what color is it? Yeah, I think that people have an affinity towards certain medium. Yeah. And, uh, and I would say uh, that watercolor is something that continues to captivate my uh, a curiosity about it. I know some people that's all they do, but oil it, it has so much more, uh, you know, bluster and force and power yeah. than in many ways. It's it's just the, uh, uh, and that appeals to me as well. And I'm still trying to find my voice. Now, when I grew up in Europe, there's a lot of languages you have to deal with. And we, you, English is not your native no. language. No. So I admire you that you have a very, you know, a great facility in two, at least two languages that I know of. So if I were to paint in, in other mediums, that's, that's a certain language, the medium itself. Mm -hmm. no. uh, if I work in charcoal, that, that literally sets the parameters. Color's not involved, and this is my language right now. And you buy into that language, and then suddenly you understand it. Uh, Van Gogh spoke a different language than any other painter at his time. Yeah. Yep. But once you start to like appreciate and accept his language, then then your world, you get introduced to Van Gogh's world and how wonderful and how beautiful it was. Wow, it's interesting perspective. Yeah, I never heard. That's interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> All right, so um, well, your website is uh, SewardWhiteStudios.com. Stuart, Stuart so SewardWhiteStudio.com. I'll put it in the description for the collectors. Uh, I would recommend uh, having you know, pieces in your collection uh, because it's a legend in front of you. And for the, for the beginners for who are watching our, you know, uh, watching right now, and they want to start, what, what, what do you, you recommend? Uh, Save up, buy good paper, uh, become familiar with the paper, how quickly it absorbs color and what it doesn't. It just become familiar with the simple things that you can handle. The other things are just more elusive, which is color mixing and things like that. Be patient with yourself with that. 
but definitely make lots of swatches, do layers of transparency, paint to the point of ugliness, to where things are dull and boring, and then you know when to stop, and you know when to, how, to, how to keep things fresh and clean, because that's the, the beauty of that medium in watercolor. Uh, brushes, you don't have to spend a fortune on them. This is a very cheap brush, but I will sell it to you for 50, 80 bucks, somewhere in that neighborhood. But no, just learn, learn brushes are, uh, they're mark making tools. And if you like the marks that they make, you work with that brush. The very expensive brushes do something very special or designed for that. And uh, so if you can get a hold of one of those, learn what it does so well. Uh, learn to paint from up here, not down in here in your fingers. You have more expression up here and you get better, better movements, less monotonous paint strokes. Yeah, uh, that's enough. I mean, that's enough to handle right there from a, a yeah. beginner standpoint. But good quality paper is important because bad paper will give you bad results. All right. Oh, thank you very much. It's always the pleasure. Uh, and speaking from my heart, it's always the pleasure to paint with you on, on the events and especially right now, just, you know, record and uh, I uh, see you, you know, doing demo, so thank you. Oh, thank you this was a really, really a wonderful experience thank for me, too. And I forgot to mention, we just discovered that Stuart is actually taking people, students, to... Sicily. To Sicily. Oh, to can Sicily. you take like, five minutes? What are, you, what, what are you doing in Sicily? Well, How much it costs and what... what yeah. I, I would sign up first. <laughs> well, that would be great to have you there. What, uh, what I'm doing in Sicily is a sort of a, a spin-off of what I started last year, which is a retreat for for art teachers and to just for us to look at what is uh, the art of teaching, basically, it's something as elusive as painting. So this year I'm taking students and one other artist, you know, Dave Savalano. Oh, wow. And he and his wife are coming. And we're going to have an intensive week of painting in an area that, you know, to me, I thought the light was wonderful. The, uh, the environments are wonderful. But we're going to be together in a villa and we'll have a chance to get to go into these things that, that we just filmed here. This is just scratching the surface, but we can go into them in a little more depth and I can get work with people a little closer. Wow. And, uh, you know, and in the evening, I think we we all sit at a big long table. We we have uh, delicious food and uh, it's yeah, you know, I, it's I can tell that, that getting together with the artists and the people in the same mindset is, is a critical, right? To, to get in the same the kind of same atmosphere, he's talking same language, not language, but, in English, yeah. but art language, right? Uh, and seeing what, who is doing what and just learn from, you know, the master. Yeah, I think that's a really, a really good experience. Another, another experience, if, if you're uh, wanting to be a, a teacher, if you wanted to be a workshop instructor, is you may know the bits of painting, but you're still a lot to learn about working with another uh, group of beginners and things like that. So I think uh, we're still trying to figure out what are the best ways to learn. It's not do what I do. It's like find out who that artist is inside of you and, and learn how to bring that forward and get rid of all the blocks that stand in the way. And that's not easy. And there's like certain skills involved in that. Great. All right, we'll put all the information and description. Uh, yeah. uh, out. For Sicily, go to salinara.com. Okay, I'll put it in the description. Yeah. All right. It's a good one. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Good. All right. Here we go.